All right, ready to dive into a world that's uh, both fascinating and a little bit creepy. I'm game. What you got? Today, it's the world of aerobic actinomycetes. Ah, those tricky critters. I bet our listeners are thinking, hang on, aren't those the things that look like fungi but act like bacteria? You know it. And as medical microbiologists, they know these guys are everywhere, right? Lurking in soil, water, even on us. Exactly. And that's why we're going deep today, especially into the ones that can cause, well, a real headache, both in the lab and for patients. For sure. We're going to arm you with all the intel you need, straight from principles and practice of clinical bacteriology. So you're not just identifying these sneaky bacteria, but really understanding them. You got it. We're talking about how they cause disease, the clinical signs to look out for. And most importantly, how to diagnose and tackle the infections they throw our way. Absolutely. Yeah. Ready to get started. Let's kick things off with the, uh, the rock star of this group, Nocardia. I was reading about this veterinarian, Edmund Nocard, who basically stumbled upon this bacteria. He was studying a disease in cattle. Oh, yeah, I remember that story. He thought he'd found the cause, but uh, turns out it was a case of mistaken identity. Classic case of serendipity in science. For sure. Nocard might have misidentified the culprit, but his misidentified organism ended up with a whole genus named after him. Not a bad legacy. Talk about making a mark, even if it wasn't quite what you expected, huh? It's like accidentally discovering a new continent while looking for, you know, a shortcut to the grocery store. Exactly. So on to the bacteria itself. Under the microscope, nocardia, they're real tricksters. They're gram positive, but they're not your typical cockae or rods. No, they grow in these long branching filaments. So they look like what? Like tiny little trees under the scope. That's a great way to put it. Wait, so the bacteria that look like fungi, and on top of that, they have a shape that's totally unique. They're really keeping us on our toes. Absolutely. And to make things even more interesting, their cell wall composition actually changes as they grow. Oh, wow. And this isn't just like uh, a cosmetic change. No, it actually affects how virulent they are. OK, that's where it gets really interesting for me. How does a change in their cell wall make them more or less dangerous? Well, think of it like this. Our immune system relies on recognizing patterns, right? to identify and eliminate invaders. Right. Well, nocardia is constantly shifting its appearance. It's like a microscopic chameleon blending into the background. So they're not just hiding. They're actively messing with our immune system's ability to, like, recognize them. Exactly. But their bag of tricks doesn't end there. They have a few more ways to uh, keep our immune system off balance. For one, they can actually suppress T-cell immunity. Whoa. That's like taking out the general of your army. Exactly. And then there's this substance they produce called cord factor. Cord factor? Isn't that one of the things that makes tuberculosis so nasty? You got it. Cord factor is this waxy substance. Nocardia uses it to protect itself. Mm -hmm. Protect itself from what? From being engulfed and destroyed by our immune cells. It basically gums up the works. So it prevents? Prevents the phagosomes from fusing with lysosomes. And then, of course, the lysosomes can't do their job of breaking down the bacteria. So they're putting on armor, A and D, disarming our defenses at the same time. Hmm. I'm starting to see why nocardia can cause such serious infections. And we haven't even talked about their use of acid phosphatase yet. Oh, right. What does that do? This enzyme helps them survive within our immune cells by neutralizing the acidic environment. An environment that would normally kill them off. You got it. They're turning our own defenses against us. Wow, they really are the ultimate microscopic ninjas. I'm almost impressed, you know, almost. But before we get too carried away with your trickery, let's um, let's zoom out a bit. Sounds good. Where do we actually find these nocardia bacteria? You mentioned they're everywhere, but is there any rhyme or reason to their distribution? Well, while they are widespread, different species have their preferences, so to speak. Oh, really? Take, for example, Nocardia asteroids, mm -hmm. one of the most common culprits of human infection, right? Right. This one tends to favor temperate climates. But Nocardia brasiliensis, that one's more often found in tropical regions. Ah, so knowing a patient's travel history could be helpful if you suspect Nocardia. Absolutely. It's all about putting those puzzle pieces together, right? Right. But this brings us to a really crucial point for you as a medical microbiologist, mm. understanding the clinical features of nocardia infection. OK, so if these bacteria are so good at disguising themselves, how do we even know what to look for in patients? What kind of infections do they actually cause? Well, let's start with the lungs. OK, that's one of the most common sites nocardia likes to target. Makes sense. 
Pulmonary nocardiosis can be a real chameleon. It can present with symptoms that look a lot like tuberculosis or even fungal infections. You can easily go down the wrong diagnostic path if you're not careful. Exactly. That's where your expertise comes in. You need to have a high index of suspicion, especially if a patient isn't responding to the usual treatments. I see. And when it comes to the actual symptoms, well, they can range from mild, almost flu-like symptoms mm -hmm. to a full-blown pneumonia with multilobar consolidation. Okay, so it really is a mixed bag. What about infections outside the lungs? I know nocardia can cause skin problems too, right? Oh, absolutely. And this is where things can get uh, pretty dramatic. Have you ever heard of Medora foot? Medora foot. That sounds like something out of a horror movie. It's not exactly pleasant, that's for sure. It's a chronic infection, often caused by nocardia, and it can lead to severe deformities in the foot. The bacteria basically invade the soft tissues, causing swelling, abscesses, and eventually these draining sinuses. I'm officially adding Medora foot to the list of things I never want to Google. <laughs> but seriously, that's a good reminder that nocardia isn't just a respiratory threat. It can cause problems throughout the body. You're absolutely right. And unfortunately, nocardia isn't always content with staying put in the lungs or skin. Oh, no. It can spread oh. through the bloodstream, yeah. leading to systemic infection. And when that happens, the brain and kidneys are particularly vulnerable. So we're talking about potentially life-threatening infections here. Absolutely. And again, the challenge lies in early and accurate diagnosis. If you're not thinking about nocardia as a possibility, you could easily miss it. Okay, so let's talk about the role of the medical microbiologist in all of this. You've painted a pretty daunting picture of this master of disguise. How do we even go about catching it? Well, that's where your skills in the lab really come into play. Laboratory diagnosis is absolutely critical when it comes to nocardia. I can imagine. It's the only way to definitively identify the culprit and get the patient on the right treatment. But you mentioned earlier that nocardia can be difficult to identify, even uh, under the microscope. Yeah, it can be quite a challenge. It all starts with collecting the right specimens. Whether it's sputum from a cough, a biopsy from a skin lesion, or a fluid sample from an abscess. You need a good, clean sample. Exactly, because any contamination could throw off the results and lead you down the wrong path. Right, of course. And even with a good sample, nocardia can be a slippery character under the microscope. Remember how we talked about its changing cell wall and all that? Yeah. The whole chameleon thing. Exactly. So if microscopy isn't always reliable, what's the next step in our detective work? Mm, what is it? Culture and isolation. Ah, uh, yes. This is where we try to coax those sneaky nocardia out of hiding and convince them to grow in the lab. And of course, we don't make it easy for them. We use special media. Like what? Like buffered yeast extract agar. Okay. To give nocardia a fighting chance while discouraging the growth of other bacteria that might be hanging around. It's like setting up a microscopic obstacle course to see who can make it through. You could say that. And here's a fun fact. Nocardia asteroids. One of the most common human pathogens. Well, it has this unique ability to grow at a higher temperature than many other species. Really? How high are we talking? Around 45 degrees Celsius. So it's like they're showing off their heat tolerance. Exactly. And that can be a helpful clue when you're trying to narrow down the suspects. Okay, so we've got our special media. We're cranking up the heat. Hopefully we're starting to see some nocardia colonies copping up. Right. But even then, confirming the identification can still be tricky, right? You're absolutely right. We often have to rely on a combination of methods to be absolutely sure. There are biochemical tests that can help differentiate nocardia from other similar looking bacteria. Oh. And then there's antibiotic susceptibility testing. Which tells us. Which not only helps confirm the identification, but also guides treatment decisions. So we're gathering evidence from multiple sources to build a solid case against nocardia. Exactly. And of course, these days we have the gold standard 16 srdna sequencing oh of course yes which allows us to analyze the bacteria's genetic material and nail down the species with a high degree of accuracy so it sounds like you need a whole arsenal of tools to really pin down these nocardia bacteria you could say that um, once you've identified the culprit the next step is figuring out how to manage the infection which can be a whole other challenge in itself so let's talk about treatment if someone comes in with a suspected nocardia infection What's the game plan? Well, as we've discussed, diagnosing pulmonary nocardiosis can be tricky. Right. It's often mistaken for other conditions. Exactly. And without a proper diagnosis, effective treatment is practically impossible. So getting that identification right in the lab is absolutely crucial. What happens once you know for sure it's nocardia? 
Well, the go-to treatment is usually sulfonamides. Okay. Specifically, a combination drug called trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Which I might know is cotrimoxazole. Exactly. Okay, so sulfonamides are our first line of defense. Yeah. But I know there could be some complications with this treatment, especially for certain patient populations, right? You're right. We have to be very mindful of patients with HIV, for example. Oh, right. Because... Well, they often can't tolerate sulfonamides. And they may be harboring strains of nocardia that are resistant to these drugs. That's a really important point. So it's not just about knowing the standard treatment, but also being aware of individual patient factors and potential drug resistance issues. Exactly. And this is where accurate identification and susceptibility testing in the lab become even more critical. Yeah. We need to know exactly which strain of nocardia we're dealing with and which antibiotics it's susceptible to. It's like personalized medicine at the microscopic level. I like that. Personalized microbiology. All right. So we've covered diagnosis and treatment, but let's talk prevention for a minute. I know you said nocardia is everywhere, but is there anything we can do to minimize the risk of infection, especially for those who are more vulnerable? Well, complete eradication is pretty much impossible given how widespread these bacteria are. Yeah, that's true. But we can definitely minimize the risks for skin infections, meticulous wound cleaning, and debridement. Debridement meaning? Meaning removing any dead or contaminated tissue. It can make a world of difference. So basic good hygiene goes a long way. It really does. And thankfully, person-to-person -person transmission is rare. Even in, like, outbreaks among transplant patients and things like and that? And even then. Okay, that's good to know. So while we can't completely eliminate nocardi from our environment, we can certainly take steps to protect ourselves and our patients. Exactly. It's all about understanding the risks and taking appropriate precautions. Well, we've covered a lot of ground with nocardia. It's amazing how such a tiny organism can cause such a variety of problems. But I know there are other aerobic actinomycetes out there that can also cause trouble. You're absolutely right. While nocardia might be the headliner, there's a whole supporting cast of characters that we need to be aware of. Let's start with a genus that's often um, sharing the stage with nocardia, especially when it comes to those dramatic foot infections. You mean Madura foot? That's the one, Actinomadura. In fact, Actinomadura is even more likely to be the culprit behind Madura foot than nocardia. So even if you see those classic signs, you can't just assume it's nocardia. Nope. You always got to consider Actinomadura as a possibility. Makes sense. And it's another reminder of why those lab investigations are so important. Right. right? Yeah. Can't just rely on the clinical presentation. Absolutely. Now, the main species of Actinomadura that you'll likely encounter um, as a medical microbiologist are, well, Actinomadura madurae and Actinomadura pelletieri. Okay. And these guys, they're they're both soil dwellers. And just like nocardia, they have a knack for those chronic deforming infections, especially in tropical and subtropical regions. I was starting to think closed toe shoes are a must have in those parts of the world. Probably not a bad idea, but let's shift gears a bit. OK, what else is there? Let's talk about a bacterium that adds another layer of complexity, Dermatophilus congolensis. Dermatophilus congolensis. OK, that name rings a bell. Isn't Dermatophilus a zoonotic bacteria? You got it. It can jump from animals to humans. Right. And it's a good reminder that as medical microbiologists, we're not just dealing with human pathogens. We need to be aware of the ones lurking in the animal world, too. Exactly. Now, Dermatophilus congolensis, it can cause all sorts of skin problems. In both animals and humans. That's right. We're talking pustular eruptions, even a condition called pitted keratolysis. Pitted keratolysis. That sounds pleasant. It's actually not as bad as it sounds. It basically causes these tiny pits in the skin, often on the soles of the feet. Well, at least it's not as dramatic as Madura foot. True. But as a medical microbiologist, you got to know about Dermatophilus. It can be tricky to diagnose. Oh, how so? Visual identification is key. And even culturing it in the lab can be a challenge. It's not always a straightforward process. So you really need to have your detective hat on. You got it. Thinking outside the box. Huh. Considering all the possibilities. Now, speaking of bacteria that love to mimic other infections. Yeah, go let's on. Let's talk about Gordona. Okay, Gordona. What's special about this one? Well, Gordona is a bit of a rare bird. Oh. Uh, but when it does show up, it can cause a real diagnostic headache. Oh, no. How come? It often mimics tuberculosis, which can lead to misdiagnosis and delays in treatment. Wow. That's, uh, that's dangerous especially since TB requires such specific treatment. 
How do you avoid falling into that trap? That's where those advanced molecular techniques we talked about earlier really come in handy. You mean like the sequencing? Exactly. Right. To be really sure it's Gordona and not tuberculosis, we often have to rely on, well, techniques like 16SR DNA sequencing. So it's another reminder that having a good molecular toolbox is essential. Absolutely. It's allowed us to identify so many organisms that were previously, well, impossible to grow in the lab. Okay, so we've covered Actinomadura, Dermatophilus, and Gordona. Any other members of this aerobic actinomycete crew that we need to be on the lookout for? There are a few more, especially those that um, tend to target folks with weakened immune systems. You mean they're opportunistic? Exactly. They're less common overall, but they can cause some serious problems. For specific patient populations. Exactly. Let's quickly touch on uh, Sucumorella, Orscovia, and Rothia dentocariosa. Okay. Those names are new to me. They're less frequently encountered, sure, but they've been increasingly recognized as causes of infection, particularly in immunocompromised individuals. So what kind of infections are we talking about? Well, they can be associated with infections related to, you know, medical devices Love like it. catheters. Okay. They can even cause endocarditis. Endocarditis. So an infection of the heart valves. You got it. Wow. So these bacteria can really take advantage of any vulnerability, huh? It's a constant reminder of that delicate balance, you know, between our body's defenses and, well, the microbial world. I hear you. All right. Get your thinking caps on. First question. What substance in the nocardia cell wall is thought to inhibit uh, phagosomal lysosomal fusion? That would be cord factor. Mm -hmm. Remember? That waxy substance. Yeah, yeah. Nocardia uses it to protect itself from being engulfed and destroyed by our immune cells. Right. Basically, it gums up the works. Right, preventing the phagosomes from fusing with the lysosomes. Exactly. Okay, so cord factor it is. On to question number two. Which nocardia species is most commonly associated with infections in uh, HIV-infected individuals? Think back to our discussion about the different species and their um, preferences. Okay. The answer is nocardia asteroids. Remember, this one tends to thrive in those temperate climates. Right. And it's often implicated in a wide range of infections, especially in those with weakened immune systems. Okay, makes sense. Question number three. What is the treatment of choice for nocardia infections? And what alternative might be needed for uh, HIV patients? Good question. The go-to treatment for nocardia infections is usually trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Also known as cotrimoxazole. Right. However, as we discussed, many HIV patients can't tolerate sulfonamides. And they might have resistant strains. Exactly. In those cases, alternatives like aminocycline, erythromycin, amicacin, or imipenem might be necessary. It's all about tailoring that treatment, right? To the individual patient and the specific strain of nocardia. You got it. Now for question four. What clinical presentation is commonly associated with dermatophilus congolensis? Let's see. Wasn't that the one that can jump from animals to humans? That's the one. Oh. Dermatophilus congolensis is known for causing a variety of skin problems, including pustular eruptions and pitted keratolysis. Okay. So it's all about those skin lesions. Makes sense. It's got derma right there in the name. All right. Last question. What makes Gordona infections particularly challenging to diagnose? Think back to our discussion about those tricky mimics. Oh, yeah? Cordona infections often resemble tuberculosis, and this can lead to misdiagnosis and delays in treatment. Ah, that's right. Gordona, the master of disguise. It's amazing how these bacteria can fly under the radar and cause so much trouble if we're not uh, careful. That's why your role as a medical microbiologist is so crucial. Yeah. You're the one who can see through those disguises and get to the bottom of what's really going on. Well, I have to say, this has been a truly eye-opening deep dive into the world of aerobic actinomycetes. I feel like I've learned so much, and I hope our listener feels the same way. Me too. And remember, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's always more to learn and discover. Absolutely. So, to all our listeners out there, keep those microscopes focused, those minds curious, and those lab coats on. Until next time, happy exploring.